This is an interview with Don Hurl for the SEC Historical Society's Virtual Museum and Archive on the History of Financial Regulation. Today is October 28th, 2021, and I'm Kenneth Durr. Don, it's good to see you today. Good to see you. Thanks for uh, taking some time to talk. Um, Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, well, well, let's go back. Um, I know you're in Colorado now. Let's go back to wh where you grew up, where you went to college, how you got involved in law. I grew up in a small farming community, Boonville, Missouri, population 7,000. Uh, I did my undergraduate work at UCLA, graduated in 1968. I went to law school in Boulder, Colorado, graduated in... Uh, 1972. Okay. Did you take any securities courses when you were in law school? You know, I did not. Although a, a curious thing in later, in, in, in later years, uh, I got to know through my work at the SEC, I got to know a securities professor at uh, uh, CU. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. She'll get that. Uh, I got to know my security, a securities professor at CU, and he uh, he remembered me. He said, "You were a very good student of mine," <laughs> and and we talked about that. And he said, "I remember you though." <laughs> but no, I did not take a securities course at uh, CU. Okay. Um... So, so what was your what was your career path after you left college? After I left uh, after I left uh, law school. Yeah. After yes, after I left CU, I uh, was looking for a job, any job, and I wound up going to um, finding a job in Pueblo, Colorado, in the district attorney's office, which prosecuted just local, you know, Colorado. Uh, Colorado criminal law, prosecuting uh, Colorado uh, violations of the Colorado uh, criminal law, uh, drug laws, burglary, uh, assaults. Uh, I got assigned some murders, but never really carried them to uh, a trial or anything. They all settled before trial. Uh, but those were the kind of things I did for three years. From there, I uh, came to, uh, I moved to Denver, uh, worked one year for a railroad company, the Colorado and Rio Grande Railroad. And from there, I went to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Denver, where I worked three years in the criminal division for the U.S. Attorney's Office and then three years for the, uh, in the civil division. Uh, for the U.S. Attorney's Office, where I handled routine uh, civil matters, tort, condemnations, those kind of things. Okay. How did you get linked up with, with the SEC? I worked with um, a lawyer in the U.S. Attorney's Office who had left the U.S. Attorney's Office and had began working as a uh, trial counsel for the SEC, who had left the SEC. And uh, uh, in the meantime, I had left the SEC, had gone into civil practice for a while, uh, did not like civil practice, and had ran across him, told him I was looking for work. And he had since left the SEC, and uh, he had said, well, why don't you uh, why don't you look at the SEC? And uh, he had uh, uh, suggested I talk to Bob Davenport, who was then head of the Denver office at the SEC. And um, he introduced me to Bob Davenport. And uh, I talked to Bob Davenport and uh, interviewed with Bob. And in time, uh, it, it interested me. And in time, uh, Bob talked to me. And it seemed like a good match for apparently Bob and was a good match for me. And Bob hired me on. 
tell me a little bit about Bob Davenport and and what he told you about about the SEC's work out there in, in Colorado. The Bob Davenport had been with the SEC for many, many, many years. And Bob Davenport in time had become a mentor of mine, but he had told me that with the work of the SEC as the, as a trial counsel, because that, that was the name of the position. And trial counsel uh, served as the lead litigator in the SEC for all matters that were in litigation for the SEC, both administrative proceedings and in federal court. And you handled uh, uh, all aspects of litigation. You were the lead litigator, although you were not exclusively the only litigator for the, for the contested litigation. Um, you uh, handled discovery. You handled the in-court stuff uh, in, in, in federal court. And you handled all of the um, all aspects of the administrative proceedings, and um, you were just responsible for everything that happened in litigation. And uh, uh, Bob told me that he expected me to handle those things, and I think Bob was interested in me because I had quite a bit by that time. I had maybe nine to 10 years uh, litigation experience. And I think Bob was interested uh, in, in, in my experience and Bob was interested in my background. And that's why he wanted me to come on board. And uh, uh, he had a number of things in litigation. Bob at that time had uh, filed a number of cases stemming from some uh, investigations that he had uh, uh, had gone through. I, I think at that time they had had a quite well, a substantial number of cases filed at that time, um, uh, resulting from some sweeps that they that had occurred in the penny stock area, and the most notable one being uh, OTC Net. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but there were several others, and uh, the, the person that had introduced me to him had just left, and I think he was an anxious for someone to take on those cases, so he had uh, sort of a vacuum, and so he had asked me to, if I was interested in it, he was interested in my, in, in, in my experience, and so he uh, had asked me to come on and to, to take those cases on. And there were some other things too that uh, uh, were pending. And so he, he brought me on. And at that period of time, and, and I had just gone into a, uh, a, a I, I was just, I had started with a small private practice law firm that was not working out for me. And so I was anxious to uh, uh, find a new position. So it was sort of a good match for me. And uh, obviously he felt it was a good match for them. And so it, uh, it was a good match for both of us. And so I took the job. So case, a case like OTC Net, that was a pretty big deal for the Denver regional office at that point. Uh, so you jumped right into that one? Yeah, it, it, it was filed at that time. And at that time there was a parallel uh, criminal case that was taking place with those defendants. Uh, sort of an interesting side note to that case. Uh, one of those defendants was um, a man by the name of Juan Carlos Shidlowski. Uh, uh, in time, and I, I guess I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, okay. but that, uh, that, that defendant had uh, uh, got permission from the judge in the criminal case to... Uh, he, get permission to obtain his passport. He had, he had to surrender his passport um, to the clerk of the court to uh, go back and forth from his home in South America. And uh, at some point in time, he obtained his passport 
from the clerk of the court. And he, he uh, got his passport later on and he obtained his passport from the court. And he actually lifted his passport from the clerk of the court. And at one point in time, he had taken that passport, gone to South America, and he actually never uh, returned to the United States to uh, answer to the criminal court nor to, uh, to, to the civil case that we filed. But, but that, I think that's getting ahead of the story a little bit. Yeah, is, is this a boiler room case? OTC net. Yeah, OTC net was a boiler room case. It uh, it was a it was a really a kind of a huge case. Um, OTC net was um, uh, oh, it was I forget the number of uh, brokers that they had, but I want to say it was like over it was around seventy five brokers that they had in the boiler room. Um, they were reputed to have. Uh, uh, that number of um, reps in the in the case, and they were reputed to have um, a practice whereby the brokers had the, the reps had to stand up at their desk in the morning, and they had to uh, tape their phones to their um, face, and they had to stand up in the middle of the room. And they had to dial their phones, and they couldn't sit down and remove the phone from their f uh, face until they had actually made a sale in the beginning of the day. Uh, never verified that, but I had some deposition testimony to that effect. Boy, that's a tough way to make a dollar. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> that's a tough way to make a buck. It is a tough way to make a buck. They had to wear a silk tie to work every day. If they didn't wear the silk tie, they had to go home and get it. And, that, and the tie that they did wear that was not silk, the uh, the uh, managers walked around. They would cut that non-silk tie off of their uh, off of their neck. Hmm. So, how much as as trial counsel now? Um, how much involvement do you have in the enforcement process? Were you providing feedback to the enforcement team or were you just essentially on the receiving end figuring out what to do with what they provided? Not Certainly not in the beginning because by, by the time I first started there and for the most part, uh, the entire time that I was there, I, I litigated cases that had already been investigated and uh, uh filed. Uh, okay. I was not involved in the actual investigation. The investigations had already been completed and filed. Um, uh, as okay. time went on, particularly when uh, I would wind up in, in, uh, in Salt Lake City, that changed because I became more of a manager and we'll probably, and, and I'm sure we're going to get into that by the time we talk about Salt Lake. But by the time, but when I started in, 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 in Denver, the cases that I worked, they were already investigated and filed. And I was working with uh, things that had already been um, investigated and worked up. Okay. Um, what you, you talked about the fact that your previous experience made this something that you were good at and, and it uh, gave Bob Davenport a reason to hire you. What kind of things did you have to learn? Uh, what was new about the, the SEC uh, trial counsel position? I'm sorry, would you repeat the question? Yeah, what, what did you have to learn? You had a lot of experience from your time at, at the U.S. Attorney's that was useful, I, I get. Um, but what did you have to learn when you came into the SEC as trial counsel? Well, certainly I had to learn the whole world of securities law and the what I had learned in the criminal law that I had to work with in the U.S. Attorney's Office and in the um, uh, in Pueblo with the criminal law you sort of you, you knew the elements of the offense and you knew how to apply the facts of the case to those elements. The 
prosecuting securities law was more nuanced. Mm. And you had to apply more of an, of an analysis and more of, well, it's an interesting question because you had to sort of bring a set of facts into an area that had, uh, you had to make out a case for fraud from facts, from circumstance. You had, you had to make out a circumstantial case mm -hmm. and you had to apply, you had to make out um, You had to make a context into fraud, and you 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 rarely had uh, someone pointing a gun. You didn't have a smoking gun, and you didn't have a hard set of facts to apply to an element. You had to say this made out a case for fraud. You didn't have someone say, "I admit this." You, you didn't have a smoking gun. Uh, you, you did that, uh, that's that's a great question because I've never really thought about it. It was sort of you had to make out. You've, you, you've really kind of I, I've never really thought about it that way, to be honest with you. Does and, this get to the whole intent to defraud the the scienter issue? I'm sorry. Let's get to intent to defraud. It's difficult to prove intent. Yeah, yeah. You 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 had to you, you had to create a frame of mind from a set of facts and circumstances and conduct that was not really that explicit. You had to sort of in, you had to infer things. You had to infer a state of mind, and you had to infer um, a course of conduct from facts and circumstances that were not explicit. You had to make it more uh, implicit and argue uh, argue, uh, uh, argue an intent from um, argue inferences argue 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 from. Argue inferences more from facts and circumstances than from explicit conduct. Is the best way I can put it. Yeah. Okay. That that's good. We'll we'll uh, let the philosophy go for a minute and, <laughs> and get back to some stories. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I couldn't do a better job with that because. No, of, that's of, good. Of, of I, I want to. Um, I just want to touch on Blinder Robinson because that's one of those colorful cases from from the Denver folklore, and you were involved in that one as well. Yes, I was involved in. I was one of the members of the trial team that conducted the um, um, administrative proceeding. There were two other people on it. I was not the lead uh, member of that team. Uh, that was a very long uh, administrative proceeding. Uh, he was certainly one of the most um, colorful. Member uh, figures in the Denver penny stock market. He um, he uh, uh, was kind of a wild character. There was also a parallel criminal proceeding on it. He eventually pled guilty and went to jail on it. As you know, one of the uh, great stories from that is uh, at one time during the uh, administrative proceedings. At one of the recesses, he came storming out of the administrative proceeding and he was talking to a reporter or talking to one of the observers there. And he made a reference to one of the other members of the trial team. And he said, if uh, if ever I, I need a heart transplant, I want his heart, referring to the other members of the trial team, because uh, uh, his heart has never been used. <laughs> <laughs> was H was headquarters involved in that one at all? I'm sorry, what? Was headquarters involved in that case? They were not involved. Well, of course, they were involved in the approval of it. They were involved in the appeals and all of that. Right. They were not involved in the uh, in the uh, trial of the administrative proceeding. Okay. 
Uh, tell me about the opportunity to go to Salt Lake. Um, how did um, that come up? Uh, the, it, it, I, at some point, realized that I did not want to spend my career as a, as a litigator. Lots of stress, lots of time away from the family. Uh, uh, I wanted to go into management. And Salt Lake was a smaller office. Uh, I wanted to get in, into management, and uh, it was a small office. I thought that was a chance to uh, do it in a smaller setting, learn the management, uh, 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 again, in a small setting. Uh, the uh, head of that office at that time was retiring. Uh, I asked Bob if he would give me Bob Davenport, because at that time, Salt Lake reported to Denver. And I asked Bob if uh, he would give me that opportunity, and he did. So that was, yeah, Salt Lake was a district office of, of the Denver region. Did it have a reputation? Was there, you know, was was there th were there things that came to mind when you talked about Salt Lake? Sure. Uh, Salt Lake, historically, it did have a... Uh, uh, an exchange. Matter of fact, I think um, I, certainly at, at, at the time that I was there, uh, it, it, it actually had a building that had a uh, uh, the Salt Lake Stock Exchange, and I think that building still exists to this day. And um, it uh, was known as uh, Salt Lake City was known as the sewer of the uh, stock, uh, in, uh, the, the securities industry. Uh, it was known as the penny stock fraud capital of the world. Uh, and so it, it had quite a reputation. I'm, yeah, I suspect it was a bit exaggerated. It was, it was fun to um, re refer to it that way. But it, it, yes, it, it had quite a reputation as being um, one of the, uh, uh, it goes back to the days of the mining industry, which a uh, small small, uh, uh, low-priced uh, uh, securities were traded, uh, but, but it had quite a reputation as being a, uh, 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 fraudulent, small, uh, small stock, uh, uh, fraudulent uh, securities. Uh, penny stock fraud. What Re was the challenge for you when you when you came in to Salt Lake as as the the uh, director? What, what did you have to learn? What did you have to get up to speed on? Well, um, Ken Israel came with me to Salt Lake. He was in Denver before I was. Uh, at the same time I was in Denver, and I really had to learn a lot about the securities law. And Ken Israel, he knew a lot about the uh, securities laws. I had the litigation experience. Ken had the securities laws. He, he had extensive knowledge, an extensive background in securities laws. And um, so I think we had a pretty good I think we made a, a good team uh, and neither of us had a lot of management experience. It was a small office. And so we had to, both of us had to learn the management side of the uh, of things. Ken had the securities business or the, the securities laws experience. I had the, or maybe the more practical side of, uh, of, 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 of things in, in the litigation side. And I, I think we made a terrific team. And the challenges were that we had to learn Salt Lake. We had to uh, 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 sort of come to understand what the whole oh, mining, small cap side of the business was. And we had to learn Salt Lake side. The, uh, the um, uh, uh, People in Salt Lake, the, the staff in Salt Lake was small, and it was going through something of a uh, turnover. And uh, 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 it, it had the reputation for being uh, sort of 
fraud ridden, if you will. So there were all sorts of challenges that we were sort of going into. And Ken and I really sort of co-managed the place. Uh, even though I was the head of the office, I think Ken and I, so, I, I think really it was a, just a, a co-management kind of thing. And the challenges were trying to get to know just the whole thing. Mm. Um, you also had responsibility for examinations at this point, which well, I assume was something you hadn't looked at before. There was there there was a manage, there there was a uh, uh, an examination side of um, Salt Lake. There were oh maybe two or three examiners, but they were managed out of Denver. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Okay, so the district was really just an enforcement office. They were, but yeah, yeah, yeah. An interesting side. I mean, uh, an interesting footnote too. Just the, the whole office layout. To get to several of the offices, you actually had to walk through other people's offices. <laughs> and, you know, you, you would start at one office, and to get to, say, the fourth office down the way, you had to walk through. You had, to, you had to walk through other people's offices. So if there was a meeting being held, you had to sort of knock on the door and say, excuse me, I'm, I am I got to get to that fourth office down the way. <laughs> so so that brought people together, ensured communications. In some yeah. Way. <laughs> yeah. Um, what were some of the cases that, that came up? I, I assume that there were some that were formative where, you know, your first few big cases. Tell me about some of those. Um, well, in, in Salt Lake, the I, I think the real focus in Salt Lake that I recall were the cases stemming from our work with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, the uh, At some point in time, the U.S. Attorney, and I think it, I think it really came up through the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the U.S. Attorney's Office. They, at one point, they approached us um, with a task force uh, because the whole problem of the penny stock issues and the, uh, the whole reputation for being the uh, sewer of the um, Sort of the securities industry, they wanted to sort of sort of farm it, 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 that whole reputation had really sort of sprung to be a national issue, maybe even an international issue. They wanted to form a, 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 a task force. They wanted to have an FBI sting operation, and they um, uh, wanted to do an FBI undercover operation. And they approached us. As a matter of fact, they wanted to have somebody assigned to their office uh, from our staff to help develop some undercover operation and undercover cases. And they wanted to bring in uh, some, some people, so some people to approach, to, to let it be known that they wanted to have a uh, uh, sting operation. They wanted to have a shell company. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to uh, uh, have a shell company, and they wanted to sell, uh, sell uh, stock to the public. And uh, 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 do pump and dumps, do 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 what is known as uh, box shops, mm -hmm. and they wanted our assistance, and. I thought that was a good idea. Went went uh, went to Bob Davenport, and Bob thought it was a good idea, but that presented certain problems. They um, uh, wanted to, uh, but there were certain problems with that because if you did that, if you did a pump and dump, that means that uh, to, to some extent, if you did the pump and dumps, members of the public, innocent members of the public, would be harmed because they would be buying. Uh, shares of a shell company that would have no real business. So in fact, we began thinking through this and 
we decided we would have to go to the commission and get their approval. So we developed a letter of understanding uh, with the FBI Department of Justice, and we actually went to the commission and the commission approved it, and we developed a, a little bit of a plan. The commission approved it, and the plan involved, yeah, we would have a shell company, and there would be like one sale of a, uh, uh, the FBI would have a shell company, they would, uh, 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 there would be one sale of a share or a, a shell. Uh, 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 there would be a sale of a, of a shell company. And once that sale took place, then there, the uh, promoter, the um, promoter, that, that promoter would be arrested the shell company would be taken down and the whoever would buy the shell, the uh, shares of, of the shell on the other side, they would actually be reimbursed for their uh, purchase. And that would be the end of, end of that particular one uh, or that particular transaction, that right. particular company. And then we'd move on to the next one. And we did that. And we did that to the extent that there were about 90 to 100 wow. such transactions and such convictions that took place. Um, that was a very successful operation. Uh, and we actually did that on an, uh, over a period of, oh, I want to say over a year. I had weekly meetings with the undercover operators or the undercover agents over that period of time. We felt that was a very successful operation. And I think the FBI did that over oh, more than just in Salt Lake City. I think they did that in a number of different cities. Uh, and we had uh, one of our staff members assigned full time to the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office during that period of time. I'm trying to figure out who well, that was in the late 1980s. Okay. We also had in the late 1980s, and this was Ken Israel's idea, we also had some significant, we also had what, uh, we had some trading suspensions um, the, uh, there were some prom some pr promoters uh, who found a way to revive some pre-1933. You were asking about some big cases. We Ken Israel identified some companies that were being promoted in the pink sheets. And these were companies that were traded in what was known as the pink sheets. Some pre, some companies that had been uh, incorporated pre-1933, prior to the uh, um, 1930, uh, the enactment of the Securities Act. Right. Therefore, uh, they um, uh, did not need to be registered under the 1933 acts and they were revived and they were revived by just simply creating a false uh, uh, false documents to, uh, that allowed them to be uh, traded on in, in the pink sheets and Ken Israel found a way to suspend trading there were i'm going to say there were it was a mass trading suspension there were two of them and there were many and i forget the number of companies that uh we suspended trading in and that uh and and those, those companies had been were, were being traded and they were being traded fraudulently and the companies had been or were being traded and they were being traded uh, to, to the public um, 
And, and again, I'm sitting here forgetting exactly how they were being traded to the public, but Ken Israel had developed a, a way to, to suspend trading on them, which resulted in them being unable to be traded to the public again. And that was a successful uh, plan by Ken that resulted in the suspension of, those, of that trading. That was one of the big actions taken by us in Salt Lake City. And that was an example of where Ken knew the Securities Act and led to successful action by the Salt Lake City office. Mm-hmm. So these are these are two big um, big cases, got headlines. Um, and, and I take it that the, the objective here is to send a message to kind of change that, that culture that you talked about around Salt Lake City. Did that happen? Did that work? I think it did. I mean, you know, you're talking going back well over 30 years, but I think it did. Um, and it's hard for me to look back and tell you uh, what the culture was after uh, I left Salt Lake City. Uh, Because I think the work of the Salt Lake City office after I left, I think the cases that they brought and the work that they did changed. And that's a reflection of the cases they identified and the cases they brought. Okay. And and that was Ken Israel. You kind of left left him to step up when you you headed out. I'm sorry. Ken Israel stepped up when you headed out to Philadelphia, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that's interesting here is that I think you're one of the few people I, I'm talking to who has uh, led four different regional offices, and. You're, we're going from Salt Lake. I, I guess Salt Lake was a district office at this point. Um, Salt Lake, Philly, Denver. Right. Fort Worth. Right. Um, this is 93 when when you left Salt Lake. And this is a period, I think, uh, Arthur Levitt's come in as chairman, and there's a bit of a reorganization. Was this uh, your move part of that reorganization? Yes. Yes. Uh, It was. Um, I left Salt Lake City for Fort Worth at the same time that there was a re that the the, the reorganization that you're referring to, but the there was sort of a realignment. Um, A number of the offices that were regional offices became district offices and reported to some offices that remained as regional offices. One example being the Philadelphia office where I went to became a district office of the New York office. Right. Others being like Fort Worth became a district office of the uh, Denver office. Uh, Seattle became a district office of the Los Angeles regional office and others too. I forget exactly. I think uh, the Miami office became a, a district office of the Atlanta regional office. Okay, uh, so you you went from um, you went from Salt Lake to Philadelphia in 1993. Um, what was your what were your first impressions? What what kind of things made you say, oh well, this is different, or I'm going to have to you know take a look at this, or or you know, what was the, the learning curve coming into a, a place on the East Coast instead of uh, the Rockies? Well, each, of course, the West to the East, just just on the personal level, of course, was different. Um, I think the big difference for me was the, uh, what, uh, just having a huge, 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 uh, 
examination program was the major change. Um, I had to learn the, um, I had to learn um, an examination, a 40 act program uh, just from scratch because I didn't really have much of a background in a 40 act program. Of course, Philadelphia area has a large um, broker dealer program and has a large investment advisor, investment company population. Um, just, just learning what that is all about, not only in terms of just that kind of an industry and learning about having well over half of your staff as an examination staff doing that kind of work and learning how they go about their work uh, just was just was a tremendous challenge for me. Uh, I got to know the two, uh, the name of the managers or the the titles of the managers of the, of the people who managed those programs were assistant directors. And we had an assistant director for the examination for the 40 Act side and for the broker dealer side. Um, they were very experienced, had been there, they had been there a long time. I got to know them very well, spent a long time with them, just, just understanding their program, how they made their assignments, how they, um, how they went about what they did. It was, uh, as I said, I just spent a lot of time just understanding the nuts and bolts of their programs and then how they interface with the enforcement side of the program um, uh, and how they interfaced, how, how they made their referrals from the examination program into the enforcement program uh, just took up a tremendous uh, amount of my time. Uh, it, 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 was, it was a challenge for me. Um, it, uh, it, uh, it, uh, and the, they, uh, they also would spend more time, the, the examination side spent more time with the enforcement side. They would identify they were much more aggressive, if you will. Identifying cases for the enforcement program and bringing cases to the enforcement program, they were much more sensitive to what should be brought to the enforcement program. And I saw that as a good thing. And I saw that as more of a, well, in comparing how that worked in Denver and in Salt Lake City, I saw that as more of an opportunity, if you will, for examination to work with enforcement. And was that just something that just happened in Philadelphia? Were there structural reasons why you encountered that there? Was it the nature of, of the cases? Um, well, I, I think it was more that there were more cases there. And I think that it was a cultural difference, if you will, because I think in Denver, I think the, maybe the personalities were such that, well, I, I think that the personalities were such that in Denver, maybe there was a more of a, in Denver, there was a more goal-oriented to get our examination program completed because we want to get our examinations done. And maybe in Philadelphia, there was more, hey, there's a problem with this particular 
investment advisor or there's a problem with maybe a fraud going on or a problem with the conduct, with the behavior that needs to be addressed by enforcement that needs to be taken to enforcement. So let's take it to enforcement. There was more of a sensitivity, if you will, with the behavior that needs to be addressed than maybe was present in Denver. Hmm. Another thing that's going on is uh, the exam program. Uh, you've got OC coming in and exams are, and the OC is trying to bring a little bit of national uh, sort of coherence to the exam program. Were you aware that that was happening? Well, OC wasn't, in, OC wasn't OC when I was in Philadelphia yet. Okay. Um, uh, OC really didn't come into being until, well, I want to say, if I recall right, 2009, 2010, uh, it, um, uh, it was still exam. Um, I mean, uh, I, I think, uh, I think there was be the beginning of a sense, uh, I think I mentioned to you in my notes that, that um, I think there was a beginning of a sense of we want this to become a national program and we want enforcement and exam to become more uh, national, a, a national sense or a, a national program. Everybody is one, but uh, it, it, it really hadn't been thought of that way. It was big, big, big. I think there was a beginning of it, uh -huh. but it, it really wasn't there yet. Uh, uh, it, I think that was part of the reorganization as it was a beginning. People were beginning to think that way. I think that was part of the uh, reorganization. It was sort of a sense that that's where they were heading, but it wasn't there yet. If that's, if that was behind your suggestion of OC. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but I think there was more of a sense that the exam and enforcement programs ought to be more together when I was when I was in Philadelphia and when they were reorganizing the districts into that they were naming districts as part of regions but no it, it, in, in my view and this is my view only it wasn't there yet um, but in Philadelphia I, I think the there was more of a sense that the examination and enforcement programs were there I didn't have that sense when I was in Denver and Salt Lake City okay so, for example, leads for cases might come from the exam staff more often in a place like Philadelphia. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that in, in, in I don't think the types of cases in Philadelphia and um, uh, were different between Denver and and, uh, and and Philadelphia. But I think the mix of cases were, were, was different. You would get more broker dealer kinds of cases. Uh, Broker dealer and uh, Forty Act cases. I, I think there were more of those in Philadelphia than there was in Denver. Uh, but the, the mix of cases, uh, we, we, there were more Forty Act, more broker dealer cases in Denver. A good example being, sort of the well-known case now was the Zanford case uh, that turned out to be sort of a, a, a groundbreaking case called the Zanford case. Uh -huh. uh, the Zanford case being the case where a, a broker dealer was um, using his discretionary authority to um, uh, uh, steal money or to, to ex exercise his discretionary authority to uh, sell securities out of his uh, uh, client's case and then stealing the money uh, and uh, using the money for his own purposes. Um, uh, that was a case that wound up to be a, a, a criminal case as well. Um, he um, uh, uh, he got prosecuted criminally, uh, and then we got a summary judgment based upon the criminal case in district court. Well, in, in district court, in, in, in the district court, he argued that we didn't have a right uh, to the uh, summary judgment because his theft of the funds was not uh, in connection with the sale of securities. Well, at the time, we, we got the summary judgment. We sort of brushed off his 
in connection with argument. And so did the district that the federal district judge sort of built that argument. Well, that eventually, as you may know, reached the Supreme Court. Uh, and the Supreme Court agreed with us that it was in connection with, but we never realized at our level that um, uh, there was really much of an issue with the in connection with argument. But it did reach the, district, uh, the Supreme Court because at the appeal, at the appellate level, the appellate court said, yeah, uh, this is not in connection with. Well, we didn't see it that way and we sort of disregarded it. Uh, it eventually reached the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, yes, this is in connection with the uh, sale of a security. Uh, but we didn't, we didn't think it was a uh, uh, much of an issue on the con in connection with. But we didn't really deal with that issue at our level. We didn't even see it as an issue. Uh, and we didn't deal with it. And, and the truth is we didn't deal with it very much at the, uh, at the uh, Philadelphia uh, district office level because uh, once it got out of our hands, out of the uh, 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 district court level, it was dealt with by the uh, uh, general counsel's office level, but it's surprising how something you don't even notice at the uh, at the district office level, at our level, in the um, um, at the commission, how something like that can elevate itself so quickly or so surprisingly into a Supreme Court issue. We just didn't see it as an issue. All right. Um, it's interesting. This this definition of in connection with was not something that the SEC was working on, like a definition of inside. No, training or something. we yeah. we just brushed it off at our level, uh, and then it got to the appellate court level, which of course the general counsel dealt with, and, and then it got to the Supreme Court level. We didn't even blink an eye at it. It just it just breezed right by us. I mean, we, I mean, at the uh, when, when we were argue, when we wrote up our Motion for summary judgment, which is how we how we dealt with it. I I don't I, I didn't go back to it, but it probably had a, a one paragraph and a short paragraph at that at our level. It was just nothing, not, yeah. nothing to us. And yet it wound up to be a Supreme Court case and wound up to be sort of an expansion of a of an argument. So you're a district office in Philadelphia, um, and you talked about there were some folks who had been there a long time. Um, it, I want to know about your relationships with the New York regional office. How much um, authority, whether, you know, just, just checking in with them or actually exercising authority, how much did they have? Um, and was, did this cause a morale issue for the folks in Philadelphia? Well, it, it, it was a new, it was a new, it was a new relationship and we were feeling our way, trying to figure out exactly what the relationship would be. Um, historically, when we were uh, a regional office, our, uh, well, I think the change was mostly with the enforcement side. And historically, when we would complete our investigations or when we had issues in our investigations, a regional office would go to Washington with questions with issues. When we completed our investigations, we would take our memos directly to DC. We would take our memorandums to, to, to DC. They would review them and there would be the back and forth as to the issues, to the memos and to issues regarding settlements. Now we had to take them to New York and New York was very extensively involved. Um, they had assigned uh, one person to be the primary reviewer and they gave it a very rigorous review. And um, that person would take a very, very close look at it or everything ranging from were we citing the correct cases? 
to grammar. And that would impact very heavily on us. Uh, my practice was to look at the memo very carefully before it went to New York. And I would look at everything from grammar to is the settlement right? Are we using the right cases? Do we have the right evidence? Have we marshaled the correct evidence? And it would be sent to that particular reviewer. And there would be an exchange between that reviewer and me and exchange. It would, it would on occasion significantly slow up the process and that would impact morale. It would, it, it, it was very substantial. And, um, uh, uh, and as I say, it would impact morale. And um, there were occasions when there would be hard feelings. Was there anything you could do to mitigate that? Well, as the leader, there? it was a challenge, of course. And uh, I would talk to the reviewer in Washington. Occasionally, I would talk to the head of the office uh, about that and try to work through that. And it, uh, he, you know, he had to bring your best people skills to it. Uh -huh. Something that showed up on on um, some of the research I did was that Philadelphia actually uh, took action against the Philadelphia Stock Exchange itself um, late in your tenure. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, and I don't have a, a great memory of that. Uh, my best memory is it was late in my tenure and I was in my transition back to Denver. And uh, I think home office was heavily involved in it. I know our people were involved in it. I remember we were involved in the examination of the Philadelphia, our, our folks were. And I know that uh, staff out of Washington were uh, staff and management in DC were involved in both the uh, 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 managing the examination and conducting the examination. And I know our people were involved in the examination of it. Uh, I was not heavily involved in the examination of it, uh, but I know our people were. Uh, and I know there were problems with uh, uh, how, how the, the funding of the um, uh, and I know funding of the operations were of concern, but beyond that, I don't have a good memory of it. Okay. It, it would make sense that DC would be involved. This must have been a very touchy subject. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, know they, I know they were concerned with it because I know they were, it was the viability of the operations. And, uh, it, you know, it was, if I recall right, it, it had to do with, it, it had to do with the funding and the money. Mm -hmm. and, and how the funds were flowing. And of course, that's, uh, that's always a touchy subject. Yeah. Well, let's take you back to Denver. Uh, it's 1996, something like that. Um, so essentially, you're coming back to Denver uh, a good 10 or 15 years later. Uh, tell me how the office had changed over the years. Um, well, one, I mean, I, I don't know, and this is not a major one, but they had stopped reviewing small offerings that they had done before. And so a lot of those personnel, I, I think that the people that had done that, they had changed. The examination people, well, a lot of the supervisory staff had changed. And I think they had changed just about that time. Uh, both on the enforcement and on the examination side. Um, a lot of the well, technology, that's about the time, at least to my way of thinking, um, technology was beginning to take hold. And people who had uh, been there both on the enforcement and the examination side who had done done their work and done it very capably who had done things 
and I don't want to say old fashioned because that carries with it sort of a pejorative uh, uh, tone, and I don't mean to be that way, but who had done it handwritten in a, you know, doing it the old fashioned way with charts. They had not gotten used to electronics. An example being, you know, how do you chart trades? Well, now you could do it with calling for electronic trading. Now they had done it by getting boxes of trading uh, tickets. Well, they, they, they simply weren't used to doing it the, the newer way, but they were retiring and their supervisors were also retiring. So a lot of the personnel and, and their supervisors, they were lead, leading, they, they were leaving. And that was true on both the examination and the enforcement side. So that was one change that had been taking place. And now, and, and, and you know, changes were being taken place in terms of the kinds of cases too, because you know the, the kinds of cases that were beginning to take place were oh the local kind of pumps and dumps, the issuer frauds, the uh, uh, false press releases. All those kind of cases were beginning to change and kind of uh, were moving away from sort of the more localized cases into cases that were more national in character. You were seeing cases that had sort of more of a national impact in some in in, in many ways. You were seeing oh cases that were you were seeing national you were seeing the rise in uh, accounting cases you know you were seeing uh, uh, larger ponzi schemes you were seeing huge you were seeing large accounting frauds you were seeing uh, inter, large inter internet cases just they, they all seem to be seeing uh, uh, a national impact. You were seeing uh, an examination program that was sort of uh, the view was more the, 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 the examination program was sort of viewed as having a national impact more than just a local impact. The regional uh, offices were seeing as sort of supporting a, a uh, a national examination program. It was all seem things were sort of larger in scope, in my view. I mean, it was mm -hmm. you were feeling yourself as sort of a national, a national. Uh, it was a national uh, uh, SEC, and not just sort of a, oh, a regional one. When I left Denver before, it was sort of, and I left Denver and Salt Lake before, it was, it sort of had a feel of being regional. It was a, it was the Denver region. Now it was uh, Denver as part of an SEC. And I, you know, and, and I think that that sort of bore itself out because as you begin reaching towards oh, later on, and this is this is getting a bit ahead of ahead of things, but when when Madoff struck 2008, and in, in 2009 and 2010, when OC and all the specialty units came in, when it, when in my mind things truly happened, it was when, when I look back on it, the OC and especially when the specialty units did come into being, that that trend really began, when I look back on it, it really began to take place back when I went back to Denver. Uh, it was really beginning to take place back when I went back to Denver in, in, in 
in uh, uh, 2000 or back in uh, uh, eight, 96. Back in 87. I think that's when it was really beginning to form up, although I don't think anybody was really thinking in those terms at that time. Yeah, you went back to Denver in, in 1996, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. And, and yeah. computer technology would have been a big part of this. I yeah, 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 because you, you could communicate with uh, the then the then Zoom, uh, version of Zoom. You know, you could, right. yeah, I mean, whatever. Yeah, you know, you could, you could have weekly meetings uh, nationwide. You, mm -hmm. you know, you, you had the technology to do that, and we began to do those kind of things. You, you could communicate. Yeah, that, that's a good one. Um, and we haven't, uh, we haven't touched on it, but how did, throughout the years, how did headquarters kind of maintain relationships with the regions? I, I believe there was an every year, there was a meet, week long meeting in DC, things like that. Um, can you tell me about some of those efforts? Well, um, yes. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure when it began. But I know at some point we began to have weekly enforcement meetings where everybody would be uh, on a conference call. And I want to say Monday meetings in which you would have exchanges where you would see everybody, not necessarily at the same time, but you could communicate and you would, the enforcement director would be on a television and you would have a conference call and you would talk about significant events coming and you would, um, again, talk about significant events. You would all report in as to what you were gonna be filing and you would, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to recover when when that all started, but you would have those and you would hit a button and you would talk about what you were doing. Were you in Philadelphia or were you in Denver? No, I don't recall them happening in Philadelphia, I don't think. Okay. I think they, would start, they started sometime when we were in Denver. Okay, that, that's, that's a good enough time frame. And that goes along with what you were saying earlier. Yeah. Uh, things kind of became nationalized. Yeah, and, and then at some point, we began to be able to plug in in the same way with commission meetings. And uh, we would, and, and at some point, um, we would, uh, we would have the capability at some point to plug ourselves in to present our cases to the commission. Hmm. And there would be a time uh, for a period of time when we would present that there was a time when we would we would go back to present significant cases to the commission in person and there, there was a time in which we would present well the um, Folks in Washington would present our cases for us. Right. That evolved into our going back to present significant cases. Then that there came a time when we would present our cases by television and significant cases, we would go back and present our cases, our significant cases in person and that would involve us going back, say, a day earlier in which we would walk around to the commission offices a day early hmm. to talk about issues in person to the various commissioners and then present the case in person at the commission table. And then there came a time when we, we would present all of our cases by television or by video, I should say, okay. in person. Okay. Well, let's talk about some of the cases in in Denver and in, in the period in which you are now regional administrator. Um, 
Well, questions, for example, you, you mentioned accounting case, accounting fraud cases, and those were, they just came in a wave. Yeah, yeah. And 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 I suspect maybe the wave is continuing. I don't know, because one of the things I did when I retired, I said I was going to, I was not going to get on any service that every time a commission filed a case, I was going to, I, I, I had not, uh, I have not been on a service that pings me every, every time a commission case is filed. <laughs> I just stopped. But I, I don't know. Yeah, the, the commission cases are, you know, filed any number of them. They, I think the most notable one was uh, the SEC versus or the commission's case against uh, Quest uh, International and Joe Nacho. Uh, uh -huh. yeah, it was a financial fraud case, probably the most notable one that we filed. Uh, uh, he was, he, they were actually uh, officed in the uh, same building we were. He was kind of a colorful case. Uh, matter of fact, there were a number of times in which I happened to be on the same elevator with him. <laughs> he, uh, uh, he was quoted by one of the other members of our staff who obviously Nacho did not know that the person was a member of our staff, but he was riding on the elevator and they were talking about our investigation and he was talking to one of his staff and he said, talked about us and he said, oh, they couldn't find it. They couldn't find a fraud. Uh, they, they couldn't find it if it was a, they couldn't find a, a fraud if it was an elephant in a haystack. In a haystack. Well, we found the damn thing. <laughs> anyway, anyway, it was a multifaceted fraud and we, we, we brought the case. It was a multifaceted accounting fraud. Uh, they were backdating contracts. Uh, to uh, meet revenues in certain periods of uh, uh, to backdating uh, contracts to meet revenue targets during uh, uh, certain periods of times. They were uh, counting uh, uh, non-reoccurring uh, non, non uh, uh, revenue uh, as if it was uh, reoccurring fraud, as if it was reoccurring uh, 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 revenue. One of the managers, uh, we, we, we found some emails with, and we found an e email in which one of the uh, managers wrote another uh, manager saying uh, uh, there are repercussions if uh, we don't make our numbers, but oddly enough, uh, no repercussions if uh, 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 we, 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 we cut corners, <laughs> but uh, there was a, uh, uh, parallel criminal case. He wound up going to jail for a number of years. Uh, he went to prison. We worked closely with the criminal authorities on that one, huh. uh, as we did with, 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 with uh, a number of the, uh, accounting cases uh, that we worked on. I, I guess that's one of the things that uh, I take a, a particular, uh, uh, I, I take some pride in because um, I guess because of my work with work in the U.S. Attorney's Office, I did some, uh, I did try to cultivate work with U.S. Attorney's Offices on. But anyway, he went to jail with that. Um, we uh, had almost weekly meetings, weekly lunch, luncheon meetings with the U.S. Attorney's offices on that, um, and and uh, uh, I think that that was successful. We had a civil case that we uh, process that we uh, I think we had like seven different officers of Quest that we uh, had civil cases against. Macho was the only criminal. Uh, uh, mm. only criminal case that came out of that. He was convicted, I want to say, 23 different counts of insider trading on that. Um, it was, I forget the, I, I, I just forget the, uh, and I had the numbers on hand right, in my mind before we started, but he, it was a multi-million dollar fraud. Uh, 
Um, but that was probably the biggest accounting fraud case. We had several others. We had Info USA, which uh, was undisclosed related party transaction. He caused nearly $10 million in payments to be made for personal luxury items, 20 cars, jet travel, club membership, several homes. Uh, American Italian Pasta Company accounting fraud leading that, that too led to a criminal prosecution, overstating pre-tax income rate, uh, pre-tax uh, uh, income overstatement. Uh, there was the, uh, we worked with the uh, criminal authorities uh, in, uh, in Kansas City, U.S. Attorney's Office there, the FBI. Um, was the commission interested in in coordinating on these accounting fraud cases since this was a nationwide phenomenon? Well, uh, I don't think it was a commission wide effort. I think okay. uh, for the most part, this was our effort here in Denver. Uh, I don't recall that it was a coordinated effort by the commission. I think the commission was interested in it. And I think I talked to, uh, I, I talked to DC, but I don't think it was necessary that, and I think the commission was aware of it at the time that we presented the cases to the commission. Uh, I think they were certainly aware of it, but I don't think it was like something that I went to the commission with and said, we need to coordinate on a nationwide basis on these matters, I think. Uh, well, to answer your question maybe more directly, I don't think I would, uh, it was something like we need to coordinate on a commission-wide basis to uh, get these accounting cases um, presented to U.S. Attorney's Office on a nationwide basis. I think it was left to individual regional offices to go to the U.S. Attorney's offices in uh, in the particular regions. I think I think individual regional offices would go on their own, and I think several of them did. I think most of us tried to cultivate relationships, and I think many of us did successfully go to U.S. Attorney's offices uh, to say this is a case you should be interested in, and I think U.S. Attorney's offices were interested and did uh -huh. pick them up. But I don't think it was like a, a nationwide effort uh, to do this. Okay. okay. Um, we talked about the fact that you you were at four uh, different regional offices, and I want to I want to get to uh, Fort Worth. You were kind of dispatched down there, I guess, uh, for about a year. Um, tell me the the background to that. Well, I I I think I think there was. And I'm trying to, I, I think there was some, some, I think there was a rough patch that was going on. And um, the head of the office left and they wanted some outside leadership and they asked me to go down there and lead the office for a period of time. And I did. Um, they had a great staff down there. And, um, and I don't know what there is to say about that beyond I, I went down there for a period of time. Well, you were talking about how the, the regions had their own kind of cultures and they were could be different in certain ways. And I, I wanted to get a sense of whether you, you know, developed an appreciation for Fort Worth's culture. Well, yeah, they, I, they, I, 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 I did appreciate their culture. They're, they had a great group of people. Uh, they had great leadership in place. Uh, you know, it's, they, they had a, group, uh, a good group of senior leadership down there. Uh, they had uh, uh, experienced leadership. They knew what they were doing. 
Um, they really didn't require a great deal of, of um, direction. Okay. I think they just needed someone down there to sit in the seat and sign off on the various things that needed signing off on, to be honest with you. Okay. I mean, I mean and, I, I, and, and, I, and I mean that very sincerely. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, they're the head of their uh, in, enforcement had been there a long time, knew what he was doing, knew, knew, knew how to lead invest. He was a former assistant U.S. attorney. He knew how to investigate cases. And um, he had uh, head of a trial unit and head of some head of investigations. And um, again, knew, knew what he was doing and knew how to, how to get people to get things done. And okay. on the examination side, they had experience, uh, they had some experience leadership. Denver and, had, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, sort of personality came out of mining mining stocks and I'm, I'm sorry, would you, I, I, Den, Denver was involved with mining stocks that's it's kind of revolved around mining stocks in the old days Fort Worth was oil and gas so I wondered if there were any traces of that left you know I don't think so uh certainly my first stint in Denver there was the traces of, of uh mining when I my first stint in Denver yes uh, but I, uh, I don't recall there being a lot of oil and gas left over in Fort Worth when I was there. Now, there might have been because, and actually, I was only in Fort Worth from like, oh, I want to say April to September. Okay. Over, over a summer. And they had, they had, uh, I'm trying to think of the cases that they had. And I don't recall that much oil and gas left over. Okay. Well, let's let's head toward the the, the later period, um, and we've we've sort of skipped over that two thousand and eight period when when the Madoff case hit, uh, and that had kind of a transformative effect on a lot of things. Um, tell me about that from your perspective. I, if I recall right, I was named head of the Denver office, permanent head, like in late November, early December of 2008. And Madoff hit um, in December, I think, yeah. 2008. And uh, that, that, you know, that, that resulted in OC, that resulted in transformation of OC, that our transformation of the exam period and creation of OC. Uh, that, that transformed everything that sort of alerted all of us to, you know, Ponzi's had been around a long time. And uh, that, that what, what, what really happened is that all of us, it dawned on all, all of us that Ponzi's were more than maybe just a few million to mega millions. And made us all realize that maybe we had to take a look at everything. And we did take a look at everything. There were mega meetings to look at mega Ponzi's, and mega. And we 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 had meetings in D.C. about to put a microscope on everything, both on the examination and on uh, the enforcement side. And uh, we, I, I can remember meetings sitting around having big round tables on the enforcement and the examination side talking about pieces and then we broke up into groups to talk about everything again and i think probably uh, i had not i had not really looked at the examination side very much except when i was at philly but i had to relook at examination side in a still a different way uh, and be part of a discussion about how we change things on the examination side and how we change things on the enforcement side and on the enforcement side that led to of course the creation of the specialty units 
And I think the biggest challenge on the enforcement side in particular was uh, getting the enforcement side, well, dropping back just a little bit, the enforcement side, one of the, the, the two things on the enforcement side was creation of the specialty units and the breakup of the branches on the enforcement side because that led to the breaking up of the branches. No longer would there be branch chiefs. Right. And that led to people, that led to some, frankly, some hard feelings because all of a sudden the assistant's job, the, 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 the structure was you had the associate, you had the assistants, and you had the branch chiefs. Well, no longer would there be branch chiefs that, 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 that broke up one level of supervision and the assistants sort of became the branch chiefs or it hmm. changed their supervision function. And I think that led to some disorientation at the assistant levels. And it led to some morale issues with the assistants. And I think the challenge as associates and as regional directors to number one, encourage the staff attorneys to take a hard look at joining the specialty units. And I think there was some resistance to that. And, and there was some resistance, I think there's some, by some uh, regional directors, some resistance by some associates to encourage joining specialty units. I, for one, felt that Staff attorneys ought to take a hard look at joining the specialty units because always there was a need to have good, solid cases to work. Working good cases, complex cases, important cases, I thought was a good thing. I think working pump and dumps, working smaller cases, especially for experienced attorneys. What specialty units did you have based in Denver? Well, none in, in the beginning, especially. Later on, there were some specialty units in, based in Denver. And now I forget exactly which ones, but there were some, but, but there were some later on in the beginning, none. Okay. Um, did you have specialty units come in from outside and work in Denver? Well, it, uh, the way it worked while I was there was that staff attorneys would join a specialty unit being being managed elsewhere. Okay. And I in, I tried to encourage my people to join the joined in special join the specialty units. You couldn't say to a staff attorney, join a specialty unit. They had to volunteer for it. Mm. And in, in the beginning, I tried to encourage them to take a look at it. And I don't know exactly how early they began doing that. They, they did while I, they began as, as time went on, and I forget exactly how that was. But I wanted, but, but I felt that it was important for them to do that because I thought I thought those cases would be more interesting, more challenging, and would give them a chance to uh, work with other people and just learn other things because they were experienced people, they were good people, and it would be important. Now I think some of my assistants in the office would be resistant to that because they would, would be losing some of their good people. But I just felt that that was a good thing. Hmm. And I, I think some of the assistants would be resistant to that. 
but I just, I thought that would be just a good thing. And I, and I really felt that the trend was going so much in the direction of we're a good, we're, we are going in the direction of one enforcement nationwide uh, enforcement group. And that's the trend and we'd better get on board. Now, I, I don't think everybody shared that view. I don't think a lot of, I don't think some of the regional directors felt that way. Hmm. That was my view. Yeah. Did, and you were, you uh, didn't retire until uh, 2013 or so. So you would have had a few years to see that unfolding. Yeah. And I, and, and, and I don't know, and I'm not sure. Exactly. I, I, I think the exam side, I think the exam side continued to evolve. I mean, I think it was more of an organic thing. And I think the, the enforcement side did also continue to evolve, but maybe not quite as quite as uh, dynamic as the enforcement side did. Okay. Or, no, I, I think the, the exam side evolved more dynamically than the, the enforcement side did, or maybe more quickly is the better one. Um, well, this has been great. Um, I've gotten a lot of good insight on on how things worked at the regions and in various times. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that that we should touch on? Oh, probably, but <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> okay. Well, I'd, thanks very much for taking the time today to talk. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care. You too.